Today on Brief History, we take a brief dive into the life and legacy of an often discounted Queen of England. As fantastic and unbelievable events played out within her family, she would watch as the crown of sovereignty inched closer and closer to her brow. Her time as Queen would see factional government, international war, incredible personal loss, and the disastrous implosion of a lifelong friendship. Join me as I take a brief look at the last Stuart monarch of England, remembered today as Queen Anne. Anne was born on February 6, 1665, at St. James Palace in London, England. She was the daughter of the infamous King James II of England and Seventh of Scotland, and her mother was a woman named Anne Hyde. Although her parents would have multiple children together, only one of Anne's siblings would survive to adulthood, an elder sister named Mary, who will be discussed throughout Anne's story. Anne would also eventually have half-siblings as well, although these half-siblings, or rather one of these half-siblings, will be discussed later in Anne's story. As is the case when discussing many of the Stuart monarchs, given the interesting sequence of events that were to lead to Anne's rising to prominence within the English royal family, it is important to give a brief backstory to the events leading up to her birth. In short, Anne was the descendant of James I of England and VI of Scotland, the first Stuart King of England. James being Anne's great-grandfather. James I's eldest son, Anne's grandfather Charles I, was executed as a result of losing the English civil wars in the mid-17th century, which brought forth the interregnum period in England in which republicanism was tested within the country. This gave rise to a man named Oliver Cromwell, a lower-born parliamentarian general who rose to prominence during the civil wars and who was eventually able to seize power and become the protector of England until his death in 1658. During the time of the interregnum in England, the House of Stuart was forced into exile for a time, led by Anne's paternal uncle, the eventual Charles II. Charles was eventually invited back to England and recognized as the rightful king of England, Scotland, and Ireland by Parliament after Cromwell's death, something known as the Stuart Restoration, or simply the Restoration. King Charles II was Anne's father's elder brother, and Anne's father himself held prestige within Britain as the Duke of York and Albany. It was during this time frame, five years after the restoration of the House of Stuart in England, that Anne was born. Anne's parents' marriage was scandalous, as her mother Anne Hyde was of significantly lower birth than her father, and her parents had been having a sexual relationship out of wedlock, which led to a pregnancy prior to Anne's birth. Nevertheless, this would not be the most important scandal that Anne's father James would be involved in as it relates to Anne, as we will see, and the future problems that her father encountered would be a direct cause to Anne's increased prestige during her life. After her birth, Anne was christened in the Anglican faith, with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Gilbert Sheldon, serving as her godfather. She was, along with her elder sister, three years her senior, raised at the Palace of Richmond, away from both of her parents. This is important to note due to the fact that she would be raised as a staunch Anglican in her youth, Anglicanism being the national Protestant religion in England. This will become important as we discuss events with Anne's parents, specifically her father, shortly. The household that Anne and her sister Mary were placed into was ran by a woman named Lady Frances Villiers, and Anne was provided all the things needed for a young child born into the noble class. She was said to have many conditions that affected her quality of life, both in her youth and as an adult, especially related to her eyes. She, like her sister, was said to have very poor eyesight and would struggle with this issue throughout her life to the point that in her youth, it was decided that she would, for a time, be placed under the care of French eye specialists. Thus, in 1668, Anne traveled to France to stay with her paternal grandmother, Henrietta Maria of France, the wife of Anne's grandfather, Charles I, who had been executed following the English Civil Wars discussed previously. Although Anne received care for her eyes, not much was gained in this respect, as one would expect considering 17th century medicine and practices. 
While in France, Anne was able to gain a solid grasp on the French language and was exposed to French culture, although her time in France would unfortunately be limited. This was due to multiple deaths that Anne's family would endure, both while she was in France and after she returned to England. Anne's grandmother, Henrietta Maria, died in 1669, at which point Anne was transferred to the household of her aunt, the Duchess of Orléans. This aunt, Henriette, who was nicknamed Minette, was Anne's father's youngest sister. Anne's aunt Minette was involved in the negotiations of the famous Secret Treaty of Dover between the King of France, Louis XIV, and Anne's uncle, Charles II of England. However, shortly after returning from England, where she had traveled to see these negotiations through, Minette died unexpectedly in 1670. After this event, Anne was summoned back to England, where yet another death of someone close to her shook her understanding of the world. Her mother, Anne Hyde, died of cancer in 1671 when Anne was around six years old. Although Anne's mother was said to have been less than interested in Anne and her sister Mary, Anne's father, James, was a different story, as he often delighted in his children, although initially it seemed that Mary may have been held higher in her father's affections initially. At this point, Anne and her sister Mary still had two other living siblings, an infant named Catherine and Anne's elder brother Edgar, but that same year both of these siblings died as well, leaving Anne and Mary as the only surviving children to their parents. This would have been a tremendously macabre experience for someone of that age, as many of the people that Anne knew were dying around her. Nevertheless, there were bigger issues at hand. What Anne didn't realize at the time was that her parents, by the time her mother had died, had already made incredible life decisions that would ultimately affect Anne's future in a major way. For some time, Anne's father had been doubting the legitimacy of the doctrinal arguments of the Anglican Church of England. He, over time, began to gravitate towards the Roman Catholic faith, which had a tumultuous and bloody history in England. James not only went through a spiritual conversion to Roman Catholicism himself, but also assisted his wife, Anne's mother, in converting as well. Thus, it was not surprising to know that Anne's father, of course, wished to see his daughters become Catholic as well. But his conversion was becoming widely known and was intensely unpopular. Thus, both Anne and her sister Mary were kept from their father's Catholic influences and raised in the Protestant Anglican faith under the orders of their uncle Charles II. With their parents' conversion to the old faith, the foundation of the incredible future events for Anne and her sister had been laid. As far as education went, Anne was instructed along the lines that her elder sister was, which included more domestic training in things such as sewing, music, language, and embroidery, although she was also able to gain a background in history and legal or political training, albeit very little. She and her sister carried on a friendship with a girl in their household named Frances Apsley, which interestingly, would be the source of the first serious breach between the two sisters, something that would become a common theme throughout their lives. Anne's sister Mary adored Frances Apsley, and was indeed quite jealous when she found out that her younger sister had developed a relationship with Frances as well. However, this friendship that Anne found in her youth would not end up being the most important or well-known friendship in Anne's life. In the time around 1670 or 1671, Anne, five or six at the time, met a young girl five years her senior named Sarah Jennings. Although the friendship at this stage and their youth was not something that was noted or even pursued, the relationship between these two girls would ultimately blossom in time and would have an incredible effect on both Anne and indeed England as a whole. Sarah Jennings will come up in a major way later in Anne's story. Anne and her sister, while continuing in their Anglican learning, watched as incredible events played out in English public life that would eventually have a major impact on both of their lives. The secret treaty of Dover discussed previously eventually led to the Third Anglo-Dutch War and the Franco-Dutch War in which England and France both attacked the Dutch Republic in 1672. This led to widespread panic in the United Netherlands as the French Louis XIV almost overran the entirety of the Dutch provinces, only being stopped by the Holland waterline. Therefore, Anne and Mary's cousin, the Dutch William III of Orange, whose power had been suppressed by the Republican powers that be in the Netherlands, was finally elected to the position of Stadtholder and began to grow in his power in his own country. He put up an incredible defense and was instrumental in halting the French's advancement into the United Netherlands. At home in England, Anne's father's Catholicism was becoming the subject of much concern, 
as his conversion had become well known. He was publicly outed in government via the famous Test Acts, which forced him to choose between his public offices or his religion. He chose to adhere to his religion and resigned his public offices, which only added to his unpopularity, which was very high at the time. These two topics, William III of Orange at war on the Netherlands and Anne's father's unpopularity, ended up playing a role in an event that would ultimately change the course of British history, the marriage of Anne's elder sister Mary. William of Orange was a Protestant Calvinist, and as we recall, was Anne's first cousin, making him the nephew of King Charles II of England and Anne's father James. William desperately wanted English support from his uncles in fighting the French, as the Franco-Dutch War continued after the Third Anglo-Dutch War concluded in 1674. The King, Charles II, however, was looking to influence his young nephew into peace negotiations with the French that could still be beneficial to the French in one way or another. Thus, a marriage was proposed between Anne's sister Mary and their cousin William of Orange. Anne's father, for his part, was initially opposed to this marriage as he still held hope that he could convert his daughters to his newfound Catholic faith and marry them to Catholic husbands. But his unpopularity forced him to assent to the match, and thus William and Mary were married in 1677, with Mary eventually leaving the household and moving to the Dutch Republic to begin her new life as the Princess of Orange. This marriage did little in the form of gaining popularity for Anne's father, and indeed he would have to suffer through the so-called exclusion crisis as time continued on. Anne's father James was the heir presumptive to the English crown, as his elder brother Charles II had no legitimate children and was unlikely to produce any at the time. Thus, on account of Anne's father's conversion to Roman Catholicism, many in Parliament, fearing for the safety of the Protestant Anglican Church of England, attempted to exclude Anne's father from inheriting the throne, hence the name Exclusion Crisis. James and his new wife, Mary of Modena, to whom Anne was said to have little affection for, were forced into temporary exile in the Spanish Netherlands, an area in modern-day Belgium and Luxembourg which was controlled by the Kingdom of Spain. James requested that his daughters join him there, and thus Anne and her younger half-sister, Isabella, traveled to the Spanish Netherlands to be reunited with their father. Two things should be noted here, however. By this time in 1679, when Anne was 14, she had already gone through strict Anglican indoctrination, and by that time had been fully guarded against the perceived dangers of the Catholic Church. So although she still retained affection for her father, she certainly did not agree with his choice in converting to Roman Catholicism. The second thing to note here is that although Anne had a half-sister by this point, this half-sister would die in 1681, and it should be understood that Anne's father and her stepmother had found it difficult to conceive healthy children and would continue to struggle with this. This would not always be the case, however, as an important half-sibling to Anne would be born in time, something we will touch on shortly. As the exclusion crisis intensified and James returned to England before being sent back into exile for a second time, it was decided that Anne should be required to return to England. Before this, however, she, her father, and her father's household visited her sister Mary, the now Princess of Orange in the United Netherlands. This meeting would be one of the last times that sisters and father would interact on a positive familial basis. Anne and her father soon returned to England at which point her father continued north into Scotland. The stage was now set for some of the most incredible events in the history of the English monarchy, and Anne had a front row seat. Once Anne returned to England, her position as the daughter of the heir presumptive became something that many were concerned about. Her marriage could have large international implications, and thus her cousin and now brother-in-law, William of Orange, and Louis XIV of France were interested in making sure that she would be married to someone that would not affect their positions on the continent. The Franco-Dutch War had ended in 1678, but tensions were still high between the French Sun King and William of Orange. William was working hard to maintain an anti-French coalition with other powers on the continent, while Louis did not want this alliance strengthened any further. George Ludwig of Hanover, an important character in Anne's story who will come up later, was initially considered as a candidate, but this did not come to fruition. Instead, after a short stint in Scotland with her father and an embarrassing scandal referred to as the Mulgrave Affair, in which Anne was said to have been seduced by a man 18 years her senior, the husband that ended up as the suitor chosen for Anne was a man named Prince George of Denmark, Anne's second cousin once removed. 
A hard bargain was negotiated in the marriage settlement, which was to see Prince George make his permanent home in England rather than Anne make her home in Denmark. There were other political motives going on here as well. Because Anne's father still had no living legitimate sons, Anne's elder sister Mary was the heir after their father in the line of succession. Thus, this put the Protestant William of Orange, who had his own claims to the English crown, in a powerful position if Anne's sister Mary did ever inherit the English crown. Thus, James was happy to see Anne married to the Protestant George of Denmark, as it lessened the influence of William of Orange on the whole due to another Protestant prince entering the picture in England. Louis XIV too was happy with the match and wanted to just flat out displace William and Mary's claims in the line of English succession with Anne and George's, but this would not end up being what ultimately happened. The couple was married in 1683 after the prince was escorted to England. This in effect now made Anne the princess of Denmark. Anne's marriage to George would be an interesting one. George was said to have been less than capable in his abilities, and was cited by some as being incompetent and a drunkard. He would have little influence throughout the years politically, but Anne was dedicated to her husband and would remain faithful to him for the remainder of their lives. Anne's marriage to George in 1683 was an important event in Anne's life. However, the time around Anne's marriage in this year was important for another completely separate reason for it is believed that this is when she struck up a serious friendship with Sarah Jennings discussed previously, who she had interacted with in her childhood. It is believed that Anne and Sarah had interacted previously to a degree, in addition to their childhood interaction, since 1673, but that the pair hadn't really connected until after the embarrassing Mulgrave affair touched on previously. Sarah by that time was no longer Sarah Jennings, for she had secretly married a man named John Churchill in 1677, and thus became Sarah Churchill. John Churchill was a favorite of Anne's father, James, and thus Sarah's marriage to him furthered her connection to Anne. Sarah was a sharp, witty, opinionated, and domineering individual who gained favor with Anne due to her matter-of-fact style and declarations that she would always give Anne an honest answer, even if it was something that Anne did not want to hear. Anne appreciated this, at least for the time being as Sarah presented herself as an honest individual and someone who could be trusted because of her tell-it-as-it-is attitude. But Sarah also had a temper, and this mixed with an incredible desire to have control, influence, and advancement through the ranks of society would lead to devastating consequences for the pair's friendship, which will be discussed in time. But for the time being, in 1683, Anne had found a companion that she trusted and delighted in, which is, of course, something that she cherished. They eventually began to famously refer to each other in their correspondence with one another by pet names. Sarah was eventually to be affectionately referred to as Mrs. Freeman by Anne, and Anne was eventually conversely to be referred to as Mrs. Morley by Sarah, although these names would not be used until after 1691. Within months of the marriage to Prince George, Anne was pregnant with their first child. This, unfortunately, was to be the beginning of one of the saddest chapters of Anne's life, as her experience with childbearing would be a sad and desperate affair. Throughout her life, Anne would incredibly lose at least 17 children through miscarriages, stillborn births, and sickness as she and her husband attempted to bring forth the family and heirs to the English throne. In May 1684, Anne suffered the first of these tragedies when she lost a stillborn daughter. Although there was still much hope that she could produce healthy children in the future, Little did Anne realize the long and devastating road she would have to endure as she became pregnant again by the end of the year. The end of the year, however, brought an end to 1684, and 1685 was to be the year that many things changed and in a most dramatic way. Anne's uncle Charles II died in 1685, thus bringing Anne's father to the throne as King James II of England and 7th of Scotland. The accession of her father was surprisingly peaceful given the fact that he was still a Roman Catholic but this was in part due to the fact that James had reassured, both through his actions and his words to those in the kingdom, that he intended to defend the Protestant Anglican Church in England despite his Roman Catholicism. This was accepted by the so-called Tory political party, who were staunch royalists but also staunch Anglicans, generally speaking. The Tory opponents, the Whigs, who were often opposed to the monarch's wishes in an attempt to prevent absolutism, and whose ranks were filled with Protestant dissenters, had to bide their time for the moment. But their moment would come, and eventually, as we will see, the Tories and Whigs would both become a headache for Anne in her future. 
In June 1685, Anne gave birth to a daughter, Mary, who survived the birth. Sarah Churchill around this time was elevated to one of the most intimate positions within Anne's household, first lady of the bedchamber and groom of the stole. In May 1686, another daughter survived the birth and was named Anne Sophia. After the first stillborn birth that Anne had endured, it appeared that this loss was now behind her, and with two children surviving the initial birth, things were looking up. But unfortunately, things were to drastically change both politically and personally for Anne, and not in a good way. In early 1687, Anne suffered a miscarriage which was followed by abject tragedy for the 22-year-old princess. A wave of smallpox swept through England and infected not only her husband, Prince George, but both of her daughters as well. Her younger daughter, Anne Sophia, died on February 4th, followed by her elder daughter, Mary, on the 8th. Prince George, for a time, clung to life by a thread, but he was eventually able to recover. This loss was, of course, devastating, and the bereaved couple retired to Richmond to mourn the loss of their children. Furthermore, the relationship between Anne and her father was growing strained. Although King James had ensured that he would uphold the Church of England, in practice he decided that he wished to find a way to grant toleration to Catholics within England. He set about making drastic changes within the kingdom that seemed to many to be inching closer to making England a Catholic country once again. Louis XIV's persecution of Protestants in his country put into perspective what could happen if a Catholic monarch with absolutist tendencies was allowed free reign with little in the form of checks and balances. Anne, now a staunch Protestant, became disillusioned with her father's actions, not only in the realm of religion, but also in regard to their personal interactions. The princess and her household was turning into a bastion of opposition, being considered by some to be a Protestant alternative to her father's Catholic one. Anne opened up correspondence on the topic with her sister Mary, who was still in the United Netherlands with her husband William of Orange. By October 1687, she suffered yet another miscarriage, but it was not Anne's pregnancy that most were interested at this point. Instead, Anne's stepmother, Mary of Modena, was the center of attention, as she had become pregnant herself, and if this child were to survive and be a boy, it would become the heir apparent to the English crown, jumping to the front of the line in front of Anne and her sister Mary. Furthermore, this child would be raised Catholic, and thus secure a Catholic dynasty in England. By June 1688, national fears were realized, when Anne's half-brother, James Francis Edward Stuart was born to her father and stepmother. This birth, mixed with Anne's father's attempts to bring Catholicism back to the forefront within his realms, caused some within England to look towards other means of maintaining Protestant control in the country. Anne's brother-in-law, William of Orange, had been in contact with some of the nobles in England for some time and had been encouraged to invade. Due to the fact that his wife Mary was still the heir presumptive, he had not truly considered this for some time, but with the birth of a son to James and a Catholic dynasty at hand, his mindset changed. He needed England as an ally against the French, and his uncle King James was not only not willing in this regard to help him, but very well could throw in his lot with the French against the Dutch. Therefore, William, after making peace with his political opponents domestically, decided to intervene in English affairs by force. In November 1688, seven months after Anne had suffered yet another miscarriage, William of Orange invaded England. It was said that Anne and her close confidants knew about her brother-in-law's plans, but with the distance that had grown between her and her father, nothing was done with the information. Anne's father for some time did not believe that his son-in-law, William of Orange, would attempt such a thing, but once he realized that an invasion was at hand, he belatedly began making preparations to defend his crown. The results were incredible. William, after landing, found that he had much support, while the king found that he had the opposite. Many nobles began to defect to William, including John Churchill, who had been promoted through the ranks of society by Anne's father for some time. Anne's husband, Prince George, who had been in the field with the king, also defected to William's cause as well. Anne was also one who did not support her father, as she and Sarah Churchill fled from London in the middle of the night, traveling to Castle Ashby and then on to Nottingham. Anne's father was distraught at not only the invasion of his son-in-law, but also the desertion of both his daughters. Thinking that his situation was hopeless and that God had deemed his cause unworthy, Anne's father slipped to the coast and eventually traveled to France after being captured and escaping. This was the beginning of an exile that was to never see King James set foot in England again. Immediately, William of Orange called Anne back to London, and both he and Anne's elder sister Mary were declared joint sovereigns not long after. Although they would be joint monarchs, the administration of the government would be controlled by William, 
and this was somewhat concerning to Anne due to the fact that she was not particularly fond of her cousin slash brother-in-law. Thus, the cold and strained relationship between Anne, her sister, and her brother-in-law began, which would be aided by the influences of Anne's close friends, the Churchills. Anne agreed to a settlement that gave up her better claim to the throne over Williams in order that he could remain king if his wife died. However, Anne and her children would be the heirs should William and Mary not produce any children, which was a likely scenario by this time, as the new king and queen of England hadn't been able to produce any children that survived. Furthermore, even if William remarried in the event of Anne's sister's death, any children that he would potentially produce with another woman would not take precedence over Anne or any of her children. Anne was not excited, per se, to give up her right in the line of succession to William, and both her sister and William himself were aware of this. It was not long before Anne was pregnant again for the seventh time, and in July 1689, a healthy boy was born and christened as William Henry, with William of Orange standing as the godfather. The boy was immediately made Duke of Gloucester, and although his health would be anything but good in the future, as he often experienced convulsions and sickness, for the time being he lived, and there was hope for his future. This, mixed with the fact that John Churchill had been made the Earl of Marlborough, made it seem as if things were on the right track for Anne and her inner circle. In reality, disputes between the new king and queen and their heir presumptive were not far off on the horizon. Anne received nothing from her father's inheritance, for which she had a claim, and as her household grew, it became clear, at least to her and her friends, that she deserved a steady income and hoped to attain this through Parliament. The king and queen opposed this, which only furthered the divide that was growing between Anne and the new monarchs. Anne ended up being successful and was granted annual funds, although it was not as much as she had hoped it would be. The deterioration of relations between Anne, the king, and the queen continued to grow as she and the Churchills began to refer to William in derogatory terms, while they themselves took offense at the slightest transgression when possible. An example of this took place at a dinner in which William, Mary, and Anne were present. He, being rude and inconsiderate, as Anne and Sarah Churchill felt, ate all of the season's first crop of peas without offering any to Anne, something she apparently took great offense to. As resentment grew between the new monarchs and Anne and her crew, trouble began brewing in Ireland when Anne's father landed there and was put at the head of a Catholic army in order to attempt to take his throne back. William was forced to travel to Ireland himself to deal with the issue, which he did admirably, defeating Anne's father's forces at the Battle of the Boyne, which forced the mentally broken former King James back into exile in France. William returned to England in September 1690, at which point Anne lost another child, Mary, who had lived for about two hours. The quarrelous nature between Anne and her sister began to grow exponentially, which was undoubtedly furthered by the influence of Sarah Churchill. William and Mary were very suspicious of the Churchills, and they believed that this couple wished to advance the claims of Anne in order to wield influence over her and ultimately gain more power. Anne's sister Mary often argued with her over this and began to continuously attempt to remove Sarah Churchill from Anne's inner circle. But Anne refused to allow this to happen and remained dedicated to her friend. Furthermore, John Churchill, as we recall, had ties to the exiled King James, and although he had supported William's invasion in 1688, this invasion being referred to today as the Glorious Revolution, many, including William and Mary, still believed that he held some loyalty to Anne's father James. Supporters of Anne's father James became known as Jacobites from the Latin translation of James, Jacobus. The idea that John Churchill held some Jacobite tendencies wasn't necessarily false, but there were many within England who were either full-on Jacobites, had Jacobite tendencies, or at least were open to the idea of a Jacobite restoration. One must remember that although we today can look back at these events knowing the outcome, at the time no one knew if James would eventually launch a successful bid to retake his throne, so it behooved many to be on the fence in case one side or the other might be successful. Anne, influenced by the Churchills, made it seem that this was the case for her as well, as she opened up communication with her father's court at Saint-Germain in France. Although she and her allies led her father and eventually her half-brother, who would become known as the Old Pretender, or simply the Pretender, that she was willing to consider a Jacobite restoration, in reality she was opposed to this and would remain dedicated to defending her claims to the English crown. Of course, her distaste for her sister and brother-in-law should not be ignored here, as the feeling of resentment very well could have played into Anne's decision to open up communication with her father's court. After William's successful invasion of England, 
He had brought England into the so-called Nine Years' War against France, which forced him to leave England every campaigning season to fight the French on the continent. After returning to England from one of these campaigns in 1691, William fully began to believe that the Churchills were Jacobites, and thus denied John Churchill the Garter, removed him from his offices, and banned him from court. Mary would later imprison him for a time when William was away, which made Anne, pregnant again, furious. Again, as William and Mary continued to attempt to remove the influence of the Churchills from Anne, she stubbornly refused and continued to look to them as some of her closest allies. In April 1692, Anne lost another child, a boy who had been named George, her eighth child lost in nine pregnancies. She lost two more children through miscarriage and stillbirths in 1693 and 1694, and this continued loss had an immense effect on her mental health. One child, William, had survived in 11 pregnancies, but his health was still poor. Not only was the loss of her children an incredible burden to bear mentally, but it had also understandably led to a physical deterioration of her body. Furthermore, she also feared that if she could not produce an heir and secure the Protestant succession, that her sister and brother-in-law might adopt her half-brother, the Pretender, and bring him into the line of succession, provided he changed religions. Thus, Anne and her husband, Prince George, continued to attempt to conceive children. However, an unfortunate event in 1694 would change Anne's future prospects. Mary, the queen and Anne's sister, developed smallpox and died. Although the two sisters had had a quasi-reconciliation prior to her death, it was done through an intermediary, and the death of Mary was still considered tragic to both Anne and many in England. King William was so distraught at Mary's death that many feared for his life as he grieved. Interestingly, this tragic event brought a degree of reconciliation between Anne and her brother-in-law, for after this, Anne was said to have acted kindly towards William in his grief, and the pair were reconciled for some time. St. James was given to Anne as her residence in London, and after the disagreements had been cleared up between William and Anne, many finally felt secure enough to re-engage with her as the heir. Sarah Churchill was opposed to the reconciliation, as she continued in her detestation of William. But this aside, it was now clear that the chances of Anne becoming queen were high after her sister's death. William, although still mentally capable, was declining physically and had always been considered somewhat sickly. Although the time that William had left in his life was minimal, major events towards the end of his reign would shape Anne's future in the most incredible way. Although the relationship between Anne and William had softened, perhaps out of necessity for both of them, it is important to note that the two cousins were far from friends and remained distant from one another. In 1696, Anne suffered another two miscarriages, and by this point, her body was becoming so deteriorated that she could not even climb stairs. It was not long before she was completely unable to walk without assistance, and this lameness would plague her for the remainder of her life. 1697 would be the year that she suffered two more miscarriages, one in March and one in December, bringing the total pregnancies resulting in loss to 14, with one surviving child, the eight-year-old Duke of Gloucester William. Although Anne continued to experience these tragedies, 1697 was an important year for other reasons politically, as this was the year that the Nine Years' War between France and the so-called Grand Alliance came to an end with the Treaty of Reichswijk. The Grand Alliance was an anti-French coalition between many European countries, whose intent was to stop French expansion on the continent. The alliance included the Dutch Republic, England, and the Holy Roman Empire, among other lesser powers as well. Furthermore, with the ending of the Nine Years' War, John Churchill, the Earl of Marlborough, was able to gain favor back with William and regain much of his prestige that had been taken away from him earlier. This is important to note, as the Earl of Marlborough will become extremely important to Anne's future. Although the Treaty of Reichswijk ended the war, this would be far from the end of hostilities between the French son King Louis XIV and the Grand Alliance, something we will touch on shortly. In January 1700, Anne suffered a stillborn birth after she had lost another child for the same reason in 1698. Although Anne believed that she would still be able to conceive moving forward, this would end up being her last pregnancy. Worse yet, Prince William, her only surviving child, died in July 1700 at the age of 11, a loss which unsurprisingly devastated Anne. All in all, through miscarriage, stillbirth, and sickness, Anne had lost all of her 17 or 18 children while in their youth, an astoundingly sad statistic to comprehend. 
Not only had this taken a mental toll on the 35-year-old princess, but it had contributed to her essentially becoming an invalid by 1700, as we already touched on. With the loss of the Protestant heir, there arose a question on who would inherit the throne after Anne, since she no longer had any living children. Some believed that Anne's half-brother, the 12-year-old pretender, should be considered if he could be influenced to switch religions. But ultimately, William and his government settled on the Protestant German House of Hanover. The Hanoverians drew their claims to the English crown through the Electress Sophia, who was the granddaughter of the first Stuart King of England, James I. Her mother had been Elizabeth Stuart, sister to Anne's grandfather, Charles I, who had been beheaded after the English Civil Wars. Sophia, by the time the 18th century rolled around, had multiple sons, including her eldest son, George Ludwig, who we briefly touched on previously. The Act of Settlement was passed in 1701, which formally designated them as the heirs after Anne. The Hanoverians, and their desires as far as the Kingdom of England went, will come up again shortly, but at this point it is important to note that by 1701, William was in very poor health, and it was clear that he would not survive much longer. Tensions had again broken out into conflict on the continent between France and the Grand Alliance, this time related to the issue of the Spanish succession. The at-the-time King of Spain, Charles II, was a very sickly man due to generations of inbreeding within the Habsburg royal family. He was without heir, and if he died, there were two rival claimants who wished to push their claims to the Spanish inheritance, which included at the time the so-called Spanish Netherlands, a buffer zone between the Dutch Republic and the mighty Louis XIV of France. The first claimant was the French Philip of Anjou, who was the grandson of Louis XIV, and the second claimant would end up being the Austrian Habsburg Archduke Charles, a younger son of the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I. When Charles II of Spain died, Louis XIV, following the offers laid out in Charles II of Spain's will, accepted the Spanish throne for his grandson, declaring him Philip V of Spain. He also kept open the idea of his grandson, now recognized as the King of Spain, becoming the King of France as well, if the French succession ever shook out that way, which would have given Philip an immense kingdom if that ever ended up becoming a reality. Louis XIV, through his grandson, ordered that all of the Spanish Netherlands garrisons should now be occupied by French troops instead of Dutch troops. This effectively eliminated all that William of Orange had fought for in the years prior during the Nine Years' War. William had battled for years to defend his Dutch homeland against the French, controlling the Spanish Netherlands, as the Spanish Netherlands had always been a buffer zone between the Dutch and the might of the French. With this action, much of William's work on the continent had been undone. Thus, with war imminent, and his understanding that he would not survive much longer, William turned to his former enemy, John Churchill, the Earl of Marlborough, to lead the English troops in the upcoming war, which would famously become known as the War of Spanish Succession. The grand alliance between the Dutch Republic, England, and the Holy Roman Empire continued in fellowship together against the French interests of Louis XIV and his grandson Philip. Anne's father, the deposed James II, died in September 1701, at which point Louis recognized Anne's half-brother, the Pretender, as James III. In March 1702, William was thrown from his horse while riding at Richmond Park, which broke his collarbone. Although he recovered for a time, he soon developed a sickness that ultimately led to his death. Anne, 37 years old, was now the new Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Although the War of Spanish Succession, which will come up again often throughout the rest of Anne's reign, was obviously something that required ultimate attention immediately, there were many other issues in the kingdom that would become important to Anne and would ultimately influence her reign. These issues included the Hanoverian succession in Scotland, the Hanoverians themselves, the Jacobite threat from Anne's half-brother the Pretender, and her relationship with the important people of the realm, specifically the Churchills, whose interactions with Anne would be strained by the infighting and factious nature of the political parties in England. The Hanoverian succession in Scotland was an important issue because the act of settlement that had settled the succession on the Hanoverians when William lived did not apply to Scotland as Scotland still had a separate parliament. Therefore, due to the House of Stuart deriving its origins from Scotland, many Scots tended to support the Jacobite cause more than those in England and were not excited by the idea of a Hanoverian being their king. Scotland also was looking for independence and still had a bone to pick with their southern neighbor with regard to the Glencoe massacre that had occurred during William's time as king. Thus, Anne and her government 
now recognized the importance of attaining a political union between England and Scotland, so that the Scottish Parliament might be absorbed and any threat of Scotland rejecting the Hanoverian succession might be overcome. Additionally, a political union would be a proper way to hedge against a possible Jacobite restoration in Scotland, which could threaten England's northern border, something that could not be allowed if England was to be at war on the continent. William had tried and failed in Parliament to implement this political union in the last years of his life, but Anne would not let this deter her. Interestingly, Anne had actually joined her father in Scotland for approximately 10 months in 1681-82 when she was around 17 years old. While there, she had witnessed her father's persecution of Presbyterians in the northern country, who refused to conform to the Church of England. This, in effect, reinforced in her the idea that Scotland was important to English security and that the religious differences between Anglican and dissenting Protestant faiths, like Presbyterianism, would have to be reconciled somehow. The political parties in England also became an important aspect of the Queen's future, as the so-called Tories and Whigs both had their perceived advantages and disadvantages, generally speaking. The Tories had historically been pro-monarchy and staunchly Anglican, but war-averse, while the Whigs had always been troublesome to the monarch, oftentimes being labeled as Republican, intended to include many nonconformists religion-wise, but tended to support the war. William, before his death, had shifted towards the Whigs out of necessity in order to continue to fund his war efforts, but Anne, being a staunch Anglican and monarch, tended to lean towards the Tories naturally, at least at first. It should be noted, however, that this is a gross simplification. By the time Anne became queen, there were multiple factions within both parties along multiple lines, including religion, i.e. Anglican versus dissenter, succession, i.e. Hanoverian versus Jacobite, international policy, i.e. pro-war versus anti-war. So although in our discussions the governmental profiles of these two parties will be somewhat simple and may reflect the majority consensus at times, it must be understood that there were opposing factions for each issue in each area of government for each party. The political aspect of Anne's reign will be discussed often, but it is important to note at this point the general, simplified stances of each party. First, you have the Tories, who were pro-monarchy and Anglican, but generally who opposed the war on the continent and the Hanoverian succession. Second, you have the Whigs, who were quasi-Republican and full of religious dissenters, but who generally were in favor of the war on the continent and supported the Hanoverian succession. The division on topics made fully supporting a single party for Anne very difficult, and indeed she would find that pushing for a middle-of-the-road ministry was the proper route, although, as we will see, this would be anything but simple and fail at times. She was staunchly Anglican and feared republicanism, which would obviously push her towards the Tories, but she fully supported the Hanoverian succession, the union with Scotland, and the war on the continent, and these issues would push her towards the Whigs. The political party division would play into one of the other important topics we touched on as well, that being her interactions with the Churchills. One of Anne's first actions as queen was to install her close friend Sarah Churchill to the intimate position of groom of the stool, while also making her keeper of the privy purse, essentially putting Sarah in charge of her personal finances. Although Anne has often throughout history been depicted as a weak, unintelligent, easily influenced monarch who was under the control of the Churchills, in modern times this idea has been questioned or even flat out rejected. She was certainly attentive in her duties as queen, and was said to have worked hard and long hours in her duties. She was involved in conferences, cabinet meetings, petitions, document signing, foreign envoy meetings, and debates, among many other things. It is true that both her and her sister had not been trained in their youth in subjects that would assist them in the political realm, but by the time that Anne had become queen, she had already experienced many things, both personally and politically, that hardened her resolve and gave her a degree of understanding of what was necessary in her role as queen. She also worked tirelessly to garner popularity, which was something that she enjoyed for much of her reign. Indeed, she was influenced by the Churchills, especially in the time after the Glorious Revolution when William and Mary were monarchs, but as we will see, she would not always be influenced completely by this couple and did not consider her intellect below the Churchills. She would over time show them that she truly was the ultimate authority in many a scenario and demanded the respect befitting a sovereign. After Anne's accession, John Churchill was made Captain General of the Army and sent to the Dutch Republic to assure the Grand Alliance that Anne would continue to uphold England's obligations to the Alliance. In her first speech to Parliament, she stressed the need for a union with Scotland, but it would be the War of Spanish Succession and the political parties that came to the forefront initially. 
Again, the Queen initially leaned towards the Tories, with the understanding that they would continue to support the war effort. They were also supporters of Anglicanism, something that Anne was serious about supporting, and so she naturally considered the Tories her allies. The Whigs, of course, were not happy with Anne's initial Tory leanings, but after certain Tories began to oppose the war, the door opened up for the Whig party. Seeing that John Churchill was inextricably tied to the war effort, he and his wife would develop an anti-Tory stance, although John more moderately, and would over time continuously attempt to influence Anne against the Tories in favor of the Whigs, or at least some of their policies. Sarah was particularly indignant on the issue, as she was sure that the Tories, who we remember tended to be opposed to the Hanoverian succession, were trying to bring Anne's half-brother, the Pretender, to the throne. Despite this, Anne continued to try and approach her government in a moderate, middle-of-the-road way. John Churchill's 1702 campaign was a great success, and he was able to force the French out of many areas in order to secure the Dutch Republic. Because of some of the Tories' hesitance in supporting the war, Anne began to look towards the Whigs and shy away from some of the Tories, although it should be noted that the Tories and the Commons did support the war effort which allowed funding for the war to continue. Although Parliament was a divided body, they were happy with the way the war had progressed on the continent. John Churchill was raised to the position of Duke of Marlborough, and he continued in his successes as Captain General. Although Anne and Sarah Churchill were still close friends at this point, the slightest rift began to form between the two of them, due to Sarah's insistence on attempting to sway Anne in favor of the Whigs. Despite Anne's desire to stray from this topic, Sarah, in her typical fashion, continued to push the matter and would not let go of the issue. Sarah always had a temper, and had always been the type to say what was on her mind, but this mindset was exacerbated by the death of her only son in 1703. After this devastating loss for Sarah, her personality and beliefs hardened to the point that, as we will see, she became her own worst enemy at times with the new queen. This loss also took Sarah away from court, and although this had not been the first time Sarah had been away from court, her distance would become more common after the death of her son. John Churchill's 1703 campaign on the continent was not as good as the previous years, but the Methuen Treaty in 1703 changed the scope of the war. The English, after allying with Portugal in this treaty, agreed to recognize Archduke Charles as Charles III of Spain. This treaty also opened up a new theater of war in Spain. Thus, the Grand Alliance went from looking to partition the Spanish Empire between the French and Austrian Habsburg claimants, to now fully supporting the Austrian Habsburg claimant, Archduke Charles. By 1704, things were looking concerning for Anne. Anne and Sarah began to seriously bicker, problems were arising in Scotland, and the war on the continent needed to be pursued and victories needed to be secured. Furthermore, the Hanoverian heir, Sophia of Hanover, in her 70s, began to become a problem as well. Many wished to bring Sophia to England in order that she could reside within the country as heir. This would allow those opposing Anne's policies to have someone to put as a head of opposition and allow people to rally around her politically. In 1704, and dismissed many high Tories, which enraged the party as a whole, at which point they looked towards Sophia of Hanover as a way to get back at the Queen. Anne had to find a way to prevent Sophia and her sons slash grandsons from coming to England while simultaneously attempting to further the union with Scotland in order to secure the Hanoverian succession. Many in Scotland, again having Jacobite tendencies, were doing all they could to subvert these attempts and attempted to use the succession issue as a way to gain commercial concessions to their northern kingdom. Luckily for Anne, John Churchill and the English army secured one of the greatest English victories of the era at the Battle of Blenheim. This victory, which prevented the French armies from attacking the Emperor's city of Vienna at a weak point in time for him, ensured that the Grand Alliance would remain in effect. The Duke of Marlborough was a hero, and Anne owed him a great deal of gratitude. Of course, her feelings for the Duke were in stark contrast to the feelings towards his wife Sarah, who was continuing to frustrate her friend. By this point, the two women began to violently argue with each other at times, but would quasi-reconcile only to correspond with each other in a petty back-and-forth, passive-aggressive communication. Sarah continued to be bitter at Anne's refusal to accept her political advice, but her connection in society through her husband had made her a necessary evil at this point as Anne could not afford to lose or offend her greatest general. For now, the former best friends simply began to grow further and further from one another. 
Anne kept her moderate policy between the Tories and the Whigs, but had at least grown more fond of the Whigs compared to the beginning of her reign. Indeed, the Tories continued to infuriate Anne by attempting to bring forward motions to have Anne invite Sophia of Hanover to the country, which was successfully opposed by the Whigs. Despite the anger that was growing towards the Tories, Anne remained in her moderate position as much as she could. By 1706-1707, it was clear that it would be much easier to attain a union in Scotland than the acceptance of the Hanoverian succession there, and the elector George Ludwig was on board with this. Thus, the Queen nominated 31 Scottish commissioners and 31 English commissioners to settle the issue. All the Scottish commissioners were already proved to be in favor of the Union. A treaty was eventually agreed upon known as the Treaty of Union, with the major provisions to include the Hanoverian succession being accepted, the independence of the Presbyterian Scottish Church being acknowledged, and that the Scots would have access to the colonial markets. This treaty would eventually be made into law when the Union with Scotland Act was passed in 1706 in England, and the Union with England Act of 1707 was passed in Scotland. Thus, when all was said and done, the union between the two realms was successful, and although the crowns of England and Scotland had been united in a personal union since the time of James I of England and VI of Scotland, this political union would officially make Anne the first monarch of a politically united Kingdom of Great Britain. Although this union would be a great success, the Queen had many more trials on the horizon, both in the short term and long. The negotiations for the Treaty of Union had been taking place around the time that John Churchill was winning the Battle of Ramillies in the Southern Netherlands, after which he subsequently pushed the French from the territory to their own borders. Other victories were being won by the Allies in northern Italy and Spain as well, which forced the powerful Louis XIV to consider peace. Unfortunately, the British were now set on eliminating the French claimant Philip from the equation completely, and declared that they would settle for nothing less than all of the Spanish possessions being put into the hands of the Habsburg Archduke Charles. As Sarah and Anne continued in their quarrel, so too did Sarah's husband the victorious Duke of Marlborough begin to drop in the Queen's esteem due to his political actions in not supporting fully Anne's moderate position between the two parties. Despite this, John Churchill remained irreplaceable while the war continued. Anne and Sarah's relationship deteriorated to the point that they were almost on the verge of openly insulting each other in their correspondence. The relationship was further deteriorated by Anne's relationship with Sarah's cousin, Abigail Hill, who would eventually become known as Abigail Masham after marriage. Sarah had previously assisted her cousin Abigail when she had fallen on hard times and was instrumental in seeing Abigail appointed to Anne's household. Anne developed a friendship with Abigail as her relationship with Sarah deteriorated, and this of course only added fuel to Sarah's already raging fire. The Act of Union was passed in 1707, which was opposed by many Tories due to their desire to protect the Anglican Church from Presbyterianism that had been guaranteed as part of the treaty. Nevertheless, the Union officially took place on May 1st of that year, and was followed by Scottish members being included into the now United Government. Unfortunately, although this was a great victory, and the military victories that the Allies had secured in the years prior seemed to allude to the fact that Britain and her allies were on pace to win the war, in reality, this was far from the truth. Multiple issues arose around this time that were to impact the Queen's future. The 1707 campaign on the continent did not go well, as the Allies were defeated at the Battle of Almanza, which secured much of Spain for the French Philip. Furthermore, many, including John Churchill and his wife Sarah, were pushing to end Anne's moderate political strategy and wished to push their initiative towards the Whigs, who supported the war effort with more vigor. With the Duke of Marlborough threatening resignation, Anne was forced to submit, which humiliated and enraged her. It should be noted that the Whigs were not fond of the Queen's position either, and did their best to humiliate the Queen themselves and make life difficult for her as well. Sarah Churchill, for her part, did nothing to relieve Anne's troubles. She began to insinuate that Anne was having a homosexual relationship with her cousin Abigail Masham, something that Anne would never forgive her for, but something that Sarah would continue to infer often. One must remember that Sarah was still in an intimate role as groom of the stole and keeper of the privy purse. Anne was forced to keep Sarah around due to the necessity of Sarah's husband's abilities in the war. The two were forced 
to interact with one another despite the fact that Anne was ready to give Sarah the boot. Anne simply saw Sarah's presence and positions as the price needed to be paid for military security. The Duke's great victories at the Battle of Oudenarde and the Siege of Lille in 1708 hardened the idea in Anne's mind that Sarah needed to be kept around in order to keep the Duke of Marlborough in his positions at all costs. Unfortunately for Anne, in October 1708, her ailing husband Prince George died, leaving Anne devastated, alone, and isolated. She now had no children, no husband, a factious government, and a group of frenemies around her who were dedicated to their own interests. It would have been a sad and frightening situation for anyone to be in. Sarah Churchill put salt in Anne's wounds as she criticized her actions in the morning after her husband's death. Although Sarah had often parted with Anne and strayed from court, after the death of Prince George, it was clear that there was no longer any possibility of a friendship or reconciliation between the two women. Mrs. Morley and Mrs. Freeman had now simply become the Queen and the Duchess of Marlborough, nothing more. Furthermore, John Churchill offended the Queen when he asked to be made Captain General for life, which would have essentially put him outside of the control of the Crown. Anne would hear nothing of it, and it was important that the upcoming peace negotiations were taken on with great care. But given the victories that the Allies had won, they believed that France was on the brink of defeat, and negotiated as if this was the case. They continued to demand incredible concessions that included the French claimant Philip being left out of the picture. Little did they know that Philip had no intention of giving up his claims to Spain, nor did they realize the beast that still lived within the French army's spirits. In September 1709, the French brought the Allies back down to earth via the Battle of Malplaquet. Although the French losses were greater on paper, they retired in formation and intact, and inflicted enormous casualties on the Allied army led by Churchill. Many of the Allies, including the Dutch, realized that a peace was necessary, and no longer wished to hold to the high demands that the Grand Alliance had demanded previously. John Churchill continued to threaten resignation if the war was not continued, and after his request to be made Captain General for life were not dropped, Anne's patience grew thin. Furthermore, many in the country who wished the war to end looked at the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough with suspicion, as many believed that the couple wanted the war to continue simply to gain further personal wealth. The international policy of eliminating the French claimant Philip from the negotiation table was becoming more unpopular as the days went on, and many, including the Queen, questioned whether this should remain as a requirement for peace. Thus, and through the influence of a man named Robert Harley, who had already fallen from grace to a degree previously, began to attempt to distance herself from the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, and, in a general sense, the Whigs as a whole. John Churchill was still a necessity at this point, but things would slowly change Anne's reliance on him over time. John returned to the continent, and his wife Sarah remained in the countryside away from court after her and the Queen had their famous last interaction in person at Kensington, in which the Queen threw off the influences of the Duchess for good. Despite Sarah's attempts to reconcile during this interview, Anne coldly responded to her in short and impersonal responses, which ultimately brought Sarah to tears. Although Sarah continued to write to Anne for a time, this only aided in furthering the divide between her and her husband, the Duke. She continued to insinuate that Anne's relationship with her cousin, Abigail Masham, was homosexual in nature, which ultimately would lead to her dismissal of offices. The Queen, fed up with the Duchess, had had enough, and forced the Duke of Marlborough to procure his wife's resignation from her positions as groom of the stole and keeper of the privy purse. This he did, once he realized that Anne's dedication to him was waning as well, and that his positions were also in danger. So ended, officially, the 30-plus year relationship between Queen Anne and Sarah Churchill, the Duchess of Marlborough. As popularity shifted away from the Whigs, the 1710 parliamentary election brought forth a landslide victory for the Tories in the House of Commons. With the desire for peace on the continent growing, international peace became the focus of matters. Further military losses in Spain made this matter even more pressing, although it should be noted that the Allies were certainly not in a weak position, as John Churchill and his armies in what would be his last campaign moved towards invading France. Furthermore, a wrench was thrown into the mix when the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph I died, making the Austrian Habsburg claimant to the Spanish throne, Archduke Charles, who the Allies had supported, the Holy Roman Emperor. One of the main concerns in opposing the French Philip in his attempts to secure the Spanish throne was the fact that he could still in theory become the King of France as well, 
which, if recognized, would bring an immense amount of power to him and the French royal family as previously discussed. But now that Archduke Charles had become the emperor, the same uneasy concerns applied to him as well. Having one man be the Holy Roman Emperor, as well as the King of Spain, would give too much power and prestige to one individual or royal family. Interestingly, the scenario touched on previously with regard to Philip having too much power nearly became a reality when the senior line of the French royal family began dying out, which brought Philip ever closer to the French throne as had been feared. Luckily, there was a sickly child that was alive in the senior French line who would ultimately survive and eventually become Louis XV, but no one could be sure of this at the time. Philip, for his part, was keen on keeping his Spanish kingdom, and so ultimately would decide to renounce his rights to the French throne in order to keep his kingship in Spain. The English had entered into secret negotiations with the French, which technically was a double cross to the Grand Alliance allies, but the desire for peace was strong. John Churchill returned to England once again, and after he continued to press Anne to continue the war, she finally had had enough of the successful duke and dismissed him just as she had dismissed his wife. The Churchills were of course incensed by this action and decided to go into a self-imposed exile on the continent in opposition to Anne's policies to end the war. Nevertheless, in April 1713, the Peace of Utrecht was finally reached, which would ultimately lead to the end of the War of Spanish Succession, although it should be noted that this peace initially only included France, Great Britain, and the Dutch Republic. The Emperor and many German state leaders, including Anne's eventual heir, the Elector of Hanover, continued the war for a time, although they too eventually came to peace in 1714. As part of the negotiations, Louis XIV recognized Anne as rightful Queen of Britain, acknowledged the Protestant succession, and eliminated his support of her half-brother, the Pretender. Philip retained Spain as Philip V, but the Spanish Netherlands, which we remember had been the buffer zone between the United Netherlands and France, went to the Austrian Habsburgs. Although many were happy with peace finally being reached, it should be noted that technically the British had left their allies high and dry to a degree, as military operations had been restrained while the secret peace negotiations were being conducted, which had led to the allies losing ground militarily and being forced into less favorable terms. This reputation for diplomatic duplicity in the pursuit of self-interest is something that the British Kingdom would unfortunately become known for, although this idea certainly did not start in Anne's reign, as many previous monarchs both in Britain and around the world did much of the same thing throughout history. However, this reputation would become important for future British monarchs and would play a part in future unfortunate events within Britain. With peace concluded and the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough out of her life, one would expect that Anne could perhaps finally settle down in her role as queen at this point. But unfortunately, the last months of Anne's life would be anything but peaceful as the specter of civil war over the succession weighed heavily on the minds of those in Britain. By the time Anne had become queen in 1702, she was already an invalid and had developed very serious mobility issues. This undoubtedly was due in part to her struggles in childbirth, but the stress and business life of being a monarch mixed with her personal struggles with friends and allies only furthered her decline. By the end of the war in 1713, she was in a very poor state physically, being overweight and in pain often. Although many of the stressors that had weighed on her mind had come to an albeit imperfect conclusion, there was unfortunately still strife that awaited the wretched queen in her final year. Because she had once again moved closer towards the Tories and away from the Whigs, as desire to end the war increased, many suspected that she was sympathetic towards the pretender and wished to bring back her half-brother into the line of succession, due in part to many Tories having Jacobite sympathies. In reality, this was not the case, as Anne remained dedicated to upholding the Hanoverian succession. But this did not mean that Anne wanted the heirs in her country, as she certainly was still against the idea of her German heirs coming to England from Germany while she still lived. Thus, Anne had to now endure attacks from the Whigs, who wanted to guarantee the Protestant Hanoverian succession by bringing the Hanoverians to Britain. Indeed, there were many Tories who were certainly open to the idea of bringing the pretender back in the line of succession, and in fact, overtures were made to him to sound out whether or not he would be willing to convert to Anglicanism in order to see this take place. As one could expect, James Francis Edward Stuart was his father's son, and he rejected this idea, remaining true to his Roman Catholic faith. 
The Whigs planned to introduce an invitation to the Hanoverians in Parliament, and Anne worked tirelessly against this, despite her deteriorating condition. Despite this, the elector George Ludwig did request that Anne extend an invitation to at least someone in his family so that they may reside in Britain. George's mother, Sophia, was still alive, 84 years old, and still the heir. However, the responses that Anne, or rather her confidants, sent to the Hanoverians as a reply to this request was harsh and direct. This harshness, mixed with Sophia's realization that she would not be able to secure her family in Britain, was said to have caused her such distress that she died in June 1714. Conversely, Anne, in her poor physical state, was greatly grieved and concerned by George's desire to see a Hanoverian be brought to Britain as well, an issue in which George continued to press. In reality, none of this would matter. Although the stakes seemed high in Britain, and there was much tension over concerns of who, Jacobite or Hanoverian, would ultimately inherit the throne, Anne's health would prove to be unable to stand up to further stressors of queenship. By July 30th, she had deteriorated to the point that she was unable to sleep. She experienced sickness throughout the night, and although she was able to pull herself together for a time in the morning, she eventually fell into convulsions, which took her speech from her. As she declined and faded further from those around her, she became unable to communicate properly or grasp her surroundings. It was clear that the end was at hand. On August 1st, 1714, at around 8 in the morning, Queen Anne of Great Britain died at Kensington Palace. She was 49 years old. Her body remained at Kensington for three weeks before her funeral took place on the 24th of August at Westminster Abbey. She was laid to rest in the vault in the south aisle of Henry VII's Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey next to her husband, sister, and brother-in-law. Her tomb marker can still be seen at Westminster Abbey to this day. The life and reign of Queen Anne is both unfortunate in many aspects and triumphant in many aspects. It was, of course, never initially envisioned that she would inherit the crowns of England, Scotland, and Ireland, and her early education surely left her unprepared for what awaited her in her future. As her life progressed, she was to witness some of the most incredible events in British history, which ultimately cemented her place in the future history of the nation. Her life was certainly not easy, as she was forced to endure political pressure from her father, sister, and brother-in-law, friends whose personal pursuits outweighed their friendships with her, a difficult and factious government, international war, poor physical health, and perhaps worst of all, the devastating and astounding loss of all of her many, many children. In this regard, Anne's eventual isolation as queen and personal losses can surely be looked at as an abject tragedy. But in another sense, her unlikely ascension and successes in her role as queen should certainly be seen as a great triumph. The fact that she was even able to make her way to the English throne in itself is incredible in its own right, but once there, her policies tended to, at least in part, be successful as well. Her often discounted policy of political moderation between warring political parties allowed her and her allies to ultimately continue the war and win great victories on the continent, which allowed Britain to secure a beneficial international peace which, in the end, elevated them further into the world power stratosphere. Her policy of attempting to keep her heirs out of Britain for her life, which could have led to further internal battles, while simultaneously defending the kingdom from the Jacobite threat of her half-brother, was a success as well, as not only did her heirs remain out of the country while she lived, but her half-brother, the Pretender, would remain in a foreign land as well and be unsuccessful in his future bids for the throne. Lastly, Anne enjoyed great popularity during her time as queen, and was successful in not only bringing forth a mostly bloodless reign from a domestic political execution standpoint, but also in assuring to a degree that a smooth transition took place after her death. Although Anne is sometimes depicted as a simple, highly influenced individual who simply fell into her role as queen, one should not forget the complex nature that is implicitly and inextricably tied with being a sovereign. Her actions towards her once beloved Mrs. Freeman should also give insight that perhaps many of the assumptions about Anne were far from true as she was anything but a puppet. Anne left this world in a state that no other monarch in Britain before or after could claim to be, for she died not only as the last reigning Stuart monarch of England, Scotland, and Ireland, but the first British monarch of a politically united Great Britain.